Hi, everyone. I'm Kaylee Lines, an anchor with Bloomberg Television in New York, and I am thrilled to be joined in conversation today by Connor Teske. He is the CEO of Renewable Power and co-head of Transition Investing at Brookfield. Connor, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Before we get right to it, I want to remind our audience that if you have any questions for Connor, you can type them into the event chat, and we will be saving a few minutes at the end to get to those questions. So, Connor, let's first off start with where you and Brookfield are and then where we're going in the future. Right now, what is your renewables capacity like and what is in your pipeline? Uh, sure. So first and foremost, Kaylee, thank you very much for having us. It's it's great to be here. Um, Brookfield Renewable today. Uh, today, we are one of the largest global, global renewable power and decarbonization companies. We have about $60 billion dollars worth of assets around the world. We have north of 50,000 megawatts of operating and development capacity, and we operate on, on five continents. And, and where do you see the growth coming from in the future? Is it in hydro? Is it in hydrogen? Is it in wind, solar? Definitely. You, 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 in our introduction there, we mentioned that we operate in five continents, but we also operate across all major technologies. And really uh, today, we have leading global platforms across hydro, wind, solar, offshore wind, storage. But in terms of where the growth is, there's really two huge levers we see for our business moving forward. One is the development and build out of incremental renewable power capacity. That is primarily wind and solar. And then secondly, over the last five to seven years, more and more of our growth activity, more and more of our investment activity has been around being a solutions provider, providing mm -hmm. energy transition and decarbonization solutions to governments and businesses around the world that have their own ESG and decarbonization goals, uh, but maybe need either an operating partner or a capital provider to help them reach those objectives. All right, so we'll get to that transition uh, uh, effort in a moment. But when it comes to your actual renewables infrastructure, it's not just about generating energy. You then have to store it. You have to be able to get it to where it needs to go. There's a lot that goes into it. Do you feel that the, the infrastructure around storage and transport is as developed as just some of these clean energy solutions themselves? Well, storage is certainly the next frontier uh, of energy investing. And when we look at the amount of renewables capacity that has been added to global grids over, say, the last decade, everyone gets really excited about that level of growth. But when you look at the forecast for how much renewables and clean energy capacity is going to be added over the next 20 or 30 years, the last decade, the, gro the growth was actually quite modest. And there's really two things that are going to unlock that future growth. One, the continued reduction in the production cost of clean energy as global supply chains across wind and solar continue to scale up. That's pretty linear. It's been happening for years. It's going to keep happening in the future. And then secondly, exactly what you just mentioned there, the build out of the grid, the reinforcement of the grid to allow for that increased renewable penetration and the big key there is storage, and storage costs are coming down very, very rapidly, similar to how they did for solar or for solar over the last five to 10 years. And that's going to unlock even more opportunity for, for the growing build out of renewables. And Connor, uh, you and I spoke on the phone before we had this conversation, and I was asking you about what we've seen play out in Europe over the last several months, where renewables aren't yet able to provide that backstop and Part of the problem is that if the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, you run into an issue with renewables. And you said it's not so much about the reliability of those power sources. It's an intermittency issue. Can you just address that now for our audience? Absolutely. Uh, renewables in themselves are an incredibly mature technology. Uh, they, they are very well run. They are exceptionally reliable. They don't break down very often. There's great maintenance and operational programs in place to ensure that those assets are always available and ready to run. The nature is exactly what you just mentioned, which is sometimes the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. That's not that the, the assets themselves aren't working, it's that they simply don't have their fuel, their input to generate power. And 
there's really a number of things that can be used to address that. One is having a diversified resource base, which is the area that, that most major markets operate in around the world today. And then the second thing is, as storage solutions come down, the cost of storage solutions come down in the future, whether that's batteries, whether that's increased use of pumped hydro, or even in the future, the, the build out of green hydrogen, um, those storage solutions will address that intermittency and essentially turn intermittent renewables into baseload power. All right, so there's the intermittency problem and something else, and I'm just using Europe as a poster child here, that this current energy crisis has showed us is that we are in the middle of a transition, but the foot is kind of on either side of the line. You are still reliant to a large extent on oil and gas at the same time that you're trying to rely more on green power. How can we accelerate that transition so that Europe and the rest of the world, for that matter, doesn't find themselves in this position again? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, in in today's environment in Europe, uh, being a uh, having access to green power generation assets is fantastic because they continue to produce at the same cost, uh, regardless of what oil prices are or what gas prices are. So the continued build out of renewables, which are essentially a zero cost uh, uh, alternative, there is no input cost into renewables, will help uh, reduce that reliance on fossil fuel generated uh, forms of production in, in the future. The, the other thing is something that you mentioned, increased interconnected interconnection, sorry, between markets will be helpful. And, and always ensuring that no market is entirely reliant on one form of generation production, that diversification point we made before. And given the number and the growing number of zero carbon energy production uh, solutions we have available to us that are cost effective today, there's a very clear path to getting to that, you know, more optimal point in the future. Solar works, onshore wind works, hydro works, offshore wind is growing very rapidly. Distributed generation is one of the fastest growing forms of energy production within our portfolio today. All of those are great cost effective solutions to address the, the situation in Europe that you mentioned. Well, there may be cost effective solutions, but that doesn't mean that the transition is going to come at little cost. I was looking at a white paper that Brookfield put out earlier this year, and it said the transition to net zero, completely eliminating additional greenhouse gas emissions, will require investment of over $100 trillion over the next three decades. Where does that money come from? The, the $100 trillion number is is one that that we were referencing as it, it was it was widely published uh, earlier this year. There's there's actually some more recent reports that could suggest that number is as high as 150 trillion. Uh, whichever number is right, the market opportunity is, is truly massive. And with any quantum of investment that large, the the majority of that capital is going to need to come from private capital, uh, public com or public uh, government balance sheets simply cannot uh, sustain that level of investment, but the private markets absolutely can. And given the very attractive commercial opportunities in investing in renewables and investing in transition, we would expect that capital does show up from the private sector and, and shows up in spades. All right, well, let's talk about some of that private capital, because as I said at the beginning there, you co-run that transition fund alongside Mark Carney, who I'm sure we all are well aware of his his uh, resume. What is the goal of the transition fund? What is the aim? Certainly. So uh, the Brookfield Global Transition Fund will be our primary vehicle for investing in and facilitating the transition to net zero. Uh, it is a global fund that will really look to invest in two key areas. One is the build out of incremental additional renewable power and zero carbon energy capacity around the world. And the second is to help businesses transform themselves to less carbon intensive and more sustainable production methods in the future. Um, we personally are, are huge believers that the right way to address climate change is not avoidance and divestment, 
but rather investing in that acceleration towards net zero and helping critical goods and services be produced and consumed in a more sustainable and competitive manner going forward. And where is it the hardest? What industries is it hardest to help them reach some of these goals? Yeah, certainly. So it's pretty easy because there's some sectors where it's really easy and immediate, and there's other sectors where it's a little bit harder and long dated. And there are a number of sectors around the world that have been dubbed hard to abate. Uh, the chemical sector, the cement sector, the steel sector. But I would say the great news is the leading corporates in those industries are actually some of uh, the most advanced in beginning their decarbonization journey and putting themselves on a 20 or 25 year path to move from their carbon emissions profile today to where it needs to be in the future. And with significant capital and some technological advances, it's all very achievable if the markets continue to support decarbonization the way they are already showing that they do. Well, let's talk about some of those targets, be it 25 years, you know, out to 2050. We've seen more and more companies say we will reach net zero by X date. Is how much of that progress do you think happens within the next, say, decade? And how much of it is going to happen much later on down the road? I would say a lot of it's going to happen in the next decade. And I'll, I'll, I'll drive that down onto one very important point. And it's something we, we see with great visibility and clarity within our business. The, most, the, the largest and most immediate decarbonization opportunity around the world today is power generation in the energy sector. And the reason for that is over 70% of carbon emissions around the world can be traced back directly or indirectly to power generation in the energy sector. And that's because it does not matter what sector of the economy your business operates in, consumer products, technology, industrial, utility, every business uses energy in the production or consumption of the goods it produces. And therefore, if you can decarbonize the energy system, you are in essence helping to decarbonize every industry around the world. That's why it's the largest opportunity. Why is it the most immediate? Because there's already a cost-effective solution, which is renewable power. And because wind and solar have already established themselves as the cheapest form of bulk electricity production in almost every major market around the world, we see the increased penetration of renewables and the decarbonization of energy consumption as driving a very material reduction in, in global CO2 emissions uh, between now and 2030. And that's all achievable. It's all cost effective. It requires no technological improvement. So that is the, the largest and most immediate near term decarbonization solution. And when we're talking about some of these admissions goals, obviously it's not just companies that are putting out their own targets. We're seeing entire countries doing it as well. That was really what uh, COP26 was supposed to be all about. I'm sure we could have an entirely separate conversation about the outcome of that summit. But, but as we see just kind of this momentum to pushing towards decarbonization, and it's not on the global scale, and then even internally in the U.S., for example, the Biden administration trying to push a green agenda. How do you see that momentum playing out in terms of how it actually starts to affect the flow of capital? It's certainly, and, and that momentum has been accelerating for, uh, I would say, years, but it's really uh, pushed at an increasingly fast rate, I would say, over the last uh, 12 to 24 months. And what we are seeing now across the world today is every major stakeholder of the global economy is supporting this, this decarbonization initiative. That is governments, that is corporates, as well as investors and increasingly lenders as well. And now that all the stakeholders of the global economy are aligned on this point, essentially every business around the world needs to decarbonize. And there are some great businesses out there that have a plan, have the capabilities, and have the capital to help themselves decarbonize. But there are also some great businesses out there 
that are missing one or a combination of those three things. And that creates an opportunity for investors and private capital to step in and fill that void, fill that void, sorry, at very mutually beneficial uh, situations under very mutually beneficial arrangements. So where are you seeing some of those opportunities, areas and industries where the the path toward decarbonization is yet not defined as clearly? Let me come at that perhaps a, a different way, because the transition to net zero is absolutely that. It is a transition that is going to play out over multiple decades. And nobody thinks the right way to tackle climate change is to stop using oil and gas and steel and cement tomorrow. That, that would be crazy. The right way to do it is to find a way to produce and consume those critical goods in a more sustainable manner. So how do we get there? Well, the first step of almost every corporate's decarbonization plan is the same. And that is to address those, those scope to emissions, the emissions that come from energy consumption within their own business. Why is that the first step? Because it's easy to do. It's through the procurement of green power. And why corporates are, are, are often excited about that as a first step is because it doesn't cost anything. Green power costs the same, if not less, than traditional forms of power generation. And therefore, the build out of renewables and the procurement of green power represents a cost effective first step in decarbonization for almost every business around the world. From there, mm -hmm. those companies and those management teams can figure out what the next step of their decarbonization plan is, which is often something much more specific to that business or that industry. It might be EV charging for an auto company, it might be energy efficiency equipment for a real estate company, it might be carbon capture and storage for an industrial company. But really that near-term opportunity in a lot of cases, in almost all the cases we see, is around green energy procurement. And that really opens up the door for an unlimited number of secondary and third steps in, in a company's decarbonization journey using a lot of different decarbonization solutions. But do those second, third, fourth steps by nature then have to become more difficult and more costly? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think renewables is so obvious today because it is cheaper and it is a clean solution. Um, EV charging is a very natural next step. And that is simply using that cheap decarbonized form of energy to power vehicles. So by definition, that shouldn't be more costly in the future either once that infrastructure is built out. So there may be some solutions in the future that do need subsidy or, or, or some form of support, but there are so much today that is available that is commercially viable um, where it can be offered to a corporate for their benefit save them money and help them achieve their decarbonization goals. If there are some needs in the future, they're certainly beyond our investment horizon today. All right, so if renewables are the easiest step one, let's bring our focus back to that specifically. When we talk about the different renewables that are out there, I know we touched on wind, solar, you need the, you need the wind to blow and the sun to shine. What about hydrogen? I feel like this is something that is talked about so much and yet hasn't fully come true to fruition to this point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we follow hydrogen very closely. Um, our business has always been about being well positioned for those next large and attractive opportunities. And we absolutely feel that hydrogen, green hydrogen, hydrogen produced from renewable power will be one of those major opportunities in the future. And there's really uh, only one thing holding hydrogen back at this point, which is green hydrogen is very uh, costly to produce. Mm -hmm. Now, the cost curve coming down is very, very visible today. Um, as the supply chain that supports the production of green hydrogen around the world scales up, and it's already scaling up very rapidly, the cost curve will come down. And that's no different than what we saw over the last 10 years in solar, what we're seeing currently in batteries. Hydrogen is just on a slight lag but we do see it as a very viable, a very large decarbonization solution. 
and one that will represent a, a tremendous opportunity in probably the mid to latter half of this decade. We, we are already pursuing so, uh, green hydrogen production in select cases uh, in unique markets around the world where it is cost effective for one reason or another, but the cost curve needs to come down for it to be a, a broad-based cost viable decarbonization solution. Why would it be more cost effective in some some areas of the world than others? What What is that defining characteristic? Yeah, there's really two major components to the production of green hydrogen. One is the capex of the electrolyzer. And as electrolyzer supply chains are built out around the world, that number is dropping very quickly. And then the second key component to the production of green hydrogen is the electricity cost. So in mm. areas where there is excess power, uh, green hydrogen is much cheaper to produce. All right, and then and something else that I know Brookfield is involved in is batteries, and this comes back to kind of the storage issue as well. Is that where a lot of the investment is going to be? Do you think, at least in the in, in the medium term? Uh, what what I would say is batteries complements intermittent renewable power because matching mm. a intermittent wind and solar with some form of storage solution allows for the creation of a 24-7 or a more baseload product. Um, storage is not new. There's a lot of energy storage around the world today, most of it today in the form of uh, large hydros or pump storage hydros. Batteries are being built out uh, around the world on a very rapid basis and being installed in more places. And hydrogen that we just spoke about represents a, a very large and attractive storage solution in its own right. What I would say is we are of the view that all these storage solutions are in fact going to be complementary to each other in the future. There is not one that is going to be the dominant solution versus the others. They all serve different purposes. Today we are investing and I think a lot of market participants are seeing more and more opportunities to invest in storage because as that cost curve comes down, there's more and more opportunities where those uh, assets are very commercially attractive uh, to build out and deploy across energy grids. All right, Connor, well, I want to, as promised, get to a question from our audience. And someone has written in, is net zero really possible if developing countries are lagging behind in terms of basic infrastructure? What do you think about that? Net zero is absolutely possible. But the, the, the question from, from the audience member is a fantastic one. It's not simply about just building the generation. It's also ensuring that that generation can be connected from production through to end user. And there's a number of different ways to do that. You can build the generation at the location of the end user for self-consumption, or you need to build out a, an electricity grid that can support a greater amount uh, of intermittent renewable power. This is does not require technological breakthrough. Uh, it's been done around the world. It's increasingly being done in more and more developed countries. And the build out of that infrastructure that supports the production of clean energy it is absolutely a, a material component of that $100 trillion that we mentioned right. earlier in the conversation. So um, it's, a, it's a very informed question because it is part of the solution is, is that infrastructure build out in addition to the production. Well, and here's another informed question. If weather patterns change so drastically that wind farms are no longer feasible, how will energy suppliers mitigate against these unknowns? So basically, how does climate change then affect renewables? Absolutely. And um, one, one, um, one fact that, that we would socialize here is intermittency uh, should not be uh, synonymous with unpredictability. Uh, weather patterns are, are largely very highly predictable, and they do not change very quickly. Uh, they change, if at all, over multiple decades, not year to year. And, and therefore, while it might be tough to predict whether the, the sun will shine or the wind will blow two hours from now, it's very easy to predict approximately how much wind will blow next year. Mm. And as a result, okay. the, the chances of these solutions becoming obsolete is, is incredibly low, if not zero. Um, it's just building that reinforcement to ensure that 
if this wind doesn't blow next hour, uh, we're still going to have power to to support everyone's homes and, and, and offices and things like that. All right, unfortunately, we have to leave it there, but great insight. Thank you so much. That's Connor Teske, CEO of Renewable Power at Brookfield. We appreciate you being part of the Bloomberg Sustainable Business Summit, Focus on Finance.